continuing with our discussion of Gauss's law, this is a very classic kind of question just to show you how it kind of gets done and what type of question is Gauss's law actually good for. So quick review, Gauss's law states that if you take the overall electric flux in and out of a particular closed surface where inwards is negative flux, outward is positive flux, it will inform you about how much charge is enclosed related by this constant epsilon naught. Now, as you can see, this integral involves vectors, direction, area of all kinds, and it can get pretty nasty. So only in a few instances can we solve for this integral easily. Otherwise, we could numerically integrate doing a point by point kind of summation. But for most questions that you'll be doing is we're going to exploit some kind of symmetry such that this becomes simpler. To make this work, we usually make the surface have, or part of that surface have some nice feature. What is nice? Nice being either E is uniform, N is uniform, and that there's some nice relationship between how the two of them plays out. Perhaps you can have E is always perpendicular to your normal vector, which means all the fields are parallel to the surface, so they don't go in and out, so therefore E dot N will be zero all the time, so that part of the surface, the flux is zero. Nice and easy. Or that E is just basically constant and uniform for that part, so E dot N is also constant, and so we can take it out of the integral. At which case, we'll be left with the integral of some area, and so that just becomes the area, which makes it easy, easy, easy to do. And this is one such case. We're talking about a long cylindrical volume. So if you draw it in 3D, it might look like this. In fact, it's really long, so it goes on forever. And that's just a uh, sort of cross section of it. And because of this long circular geometry, we, it has what's called, surprise, surprise, cylindrical symmetry, where if you rotate it kind of this way, you're not going to notice any difference. And that it's, the problem is essentially the same even if you translate it back and forth because this rod is so long. So therefore, here's where physics can help out a lot with the math, is that given that the only plausible solution is that the electric field must also have circular symmetry and the only way for that to happen is for the field to all go away from the cylinder perpendicular to the length of the cylinder. How, how do I mean by that? So if we draw the front view, the only plausible arrangement would be that all the field either radiates outwards if it's a positive charge. That's what we'll assume for now because they just give us rho. Uh, or it all goes radially inwards if it's a negative. If you look on it from the side, all the electric field must go away from it and parallel in that sense. Because otherwise, if you translate it along the length of the cylinder, you're not going to have that symmetry anymore. And that works even for inside the cylinder, where the field might be smaller, as you will see as we go ahead and solve this question. So we have two cases. We have the first case here, where we have the R that's changing is less than the R of the cylinder. So this is inside the cylinder. We're ultimately interested in, at some point inside the cylinder, with I guess this radius called R, axis, some point inside the radius, what is the electric field? And to do that, we would take also a cylindrical Gaussian surface, or if you look at it sideways, we have a point here, so we want to have a cylinder of that shape with a certain radius, r, and a certain length, l. So then back in the 3D view, you can see that we're sort of doing this. It's some cylinder inside with radius r and length l. And you can see that in the cylinder, there's three sort of surfaces. There's the two end caps, and I guess what we call the side. You think of a soda can, you got the top and bottom of the soda can, and then the side where you have the fancy label. We'll treat each of these separately 
and you'll see how some of these fit into either this category or this category and it makes our lives so much easier and we will kind of bypass the integration step so in the case of the end caps you can see from this diagram here even though the electric field all along here if we zoom in we have the surface like that near the middle you might imagine that the field might be small and then it gets bigger and bigger even though the E isn't exactly uniform but for all the points E is perpendicular to my N vector where my N vector for every one of these points looks like that or you can think of it as a electric field is all parallel to the surface and so with that E dot N gives you zero for all those so the flux for the end caps is equal to zero. That's pretty simple. So then we're just left with the side. For the side, you can see that all along here, the electric field is always perpendicular to my surface or parallel to my normal, so to speak. Because the radius is the same, circular symmetry, you would imagine that for every one of these points, the electric field would be the same. So here we have the case of here we have a case of the E being the same size or magnitude seems to be perpendicular to my little bit of surface right there. So perpendicular to the surface or parallel to N in first of all that this picture, but also in this picture when you see over here that because of the circle, this is also perpendicular. So this is very true. At every single point along the surface, we have E to have a certain magnitude and it's parallel to my n. So therefore, that's just equal to the magnitude of E, which is a constant number. Therefore, the flux of just the side bit, which is the only bit because the end cap gives us zero, is some constant multiplied by dA. So the constant can come out front, which just gives us the area of the side. Now, the area of the side of a cylinder, if you cut a cylinder like this and you spread it out, you end up with a rectangle. The rectangle has a certain height length. And if this is the radius r, this would be the circumference all the way around of 2 pi r. So you just know that 2 pi r l and then the magnitude of e. So that's one half of your Gauss's law. The other half of the Gauss's law is charge enclosed. In this case, they give us the volume charge density, which in this case is uniform. We just multiply by the volume enclosed to get the charge as enclosed. In this case, the volume enclosed is the volume of the entire cylinder because everything is inside here. That part is what the part we want. That part is the part we want. So volume of the cylinder is given by pi r square times L. Putting that together using Gauss's law relating the two sides, we have the flux is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So the flux is just due to the side. The two end caps don't matter. That's what we have. Q enclosed is given by that divided by epsilon naught. Some stuff cancel out. The L also cancel out, which is great. And so we're solving for the magnitude of the electric field, which we know which way it goes outwards due to circular symmetry. And we get our answer which is what we're trying to prove. So this only works so far for the case of R less than big R, which means inside the cylinder. Now for the case of outside the cylinder, let's redraw some of our diagrams quickly. So here again, it's a charged cylinder with its electric field that it's causing cylindrical symmetry. And so this time we need to get the E on some point outside the cylinder. So if we are interested in this, we know that all along the circle, due to circular symmetry, they would have the same magnitude of E. So that's why we'll pick a circle that big, make it into a full cylinder that big. And it follows very similarly to the last part where all along these points, the E here is perpendicular to the surface or parallel to the normal on both ways. They're both parallel and it's the same magnitude all the way around. This time your R is bigger than the R of the cylinder. So the only thing that actually changes is the charge that's enclosed. 
because before we're only grabbing part of the charge of the cylinder now we're enclosing the entire cylinder so the flux is given by the exact same expression as we had before where again the end caps don't matter because the electric field here is all parallel to the surface or perpendicular to my normal and the psi that's giving us the magnitude of the electric field that we want multiplied by the area which is 2 pi rl unfolding that side of the soda can except now the charge enclosed is rho times the volume but not the volume of my Gaussian surface because you can see that there's a lot of empty spaces out here that has no charge the only part that has charge is the cylinder itself which has a radius smaller than my Gaussian surface which so it's big R not little r so then it's rho times pi big R square times L putting that together let's see pi cancels L cancels small r big R different things do not cancel solving for E we get the expression that we're asked for for the case of little r bigger than the r of the cylinder fairly standard question and goes to show how we can make use of the appropriate symmetry to make our integral and our use of Gauss's law a lot easier.